Good morning. The Lord bless you. Welcome to our worship experience. We're so excited to welcome all of you here today. Please make sure you're signed in to YouTube and that way you can leave comments and fellowship one with another. As we prepare to worship today, we thank God for your presence and for another day that God has created for our enjoyment. Let us worship the Lord together. Please be mindful that our virtual Bible class and 30 days of prayer will resume on Monday, April the 27th. We will not be meeting on next week for 30 days of prayer, nor for Bible study. Please take this opportunity to catch up on what you have missed. There's some wonderful material that is available for your consumption, and I ask that you would please enjoy it and engage in it. God bless you. Let's give God praise and worship now as we go into our call to worship, followed by invocation. We'll hear the announcements, song by the choir, the word of the Lord, and I'll close with a hymn today. God bless you. Let's worship the Lord together, New Mountaintop. Good morning, New Mountaintop. This is our call to worship. I will be reading from John 4, verse 23 says, But the hour cometh, and now is. When the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. And verse 24 says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Do I have any true worshipers out there? You know that it's not about the location, it's not about the building, but it's about a heart that's turned toward God. So let's worship Him this morning. Amen. Good morning, Mountaintop. I'm Reverend Fred Pope, and I'm here to lead you in your morning prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for waking us up this morning, closing our right mind, giving us one more chance to serve a true and living God, Father. Right now, with so much uncertainty going on, Father, the loss of jobs, the displacement, Father, Lord, we know that there's just so much going on, so much fear, Father. We know that you don't give us a spirit of fear, but you're giving us a spirit of power, Father. So we know that we're already overcome as fears, Lord. We know that this situation did not come upon you by surprise, Father. We know that you've already prepared a way for us, Father. So we're just standing, Father. We're drawing closer to you. Lord, I just ask that during this time that we would just just find our secret closet, Father, and just get inside it, Lord, and draw closer to you, Father. So we can just hear your voice, Father. Lord, we ask a special blessing over the head of this house, Father. We ask that you bless our pastor, keep his family safe, Father, and keep their health away, Father. Lord, we ask that you just continue to watch over the whole flock, Father, that you bless us all individually and collectively, Father, that you watch over our health, Father, that you watch over our finance, Father, that you watch over the gates of our mind, Father, that you watch over the gates of our ears, Father, our heart, Father, just continue to let us know that we're loved and you're protecting us, Father. You said that you take care of the birds of the air, Father, and that, Lord, we know that we're made in your image, Father. And we know you'll do even more for us, Lord. So we're just standing on that, Father. We're leaning and depending on that, Father. You said that we can come to you, Father, and ask of anything that we desire, Father. And that, Lord, as if we would keep our hands in your hands, Father, that you would answer our prayers, Father. So right now, Father, I'm just asking that you open up your gates of heaven, Father, and pour down a healing on this land, Father. Lord, and we'd be so ever careful to give you all the honor and the praise, Father, that's due only unto you. And in your holy name, Father, right now we pray. Amen and amen. Hello. Welcome to New Mountain Top News on Resurrection Sunday. This is a reminder that we will begin our virtual Sunday school class on Resurrection Sunday from 8.15 to 9.15 a.m. with our very own Deacon Michael Polk. To tune in, please call the number and use the access code displayed on your screen. Attention all women, please join the Women of Excellence in another virtual Bible study exploring Proverbs 31. We will begin our She 31 Woman of Valor Bible Plan on Resurrection Sunday. And each Sunday, starting April 19th, 
we will have a video discussion of the plan using Zoom video conferencing. If you haven't already joined, please sign up using the link displayed on your screen. For women's ministry updates and reminders, please join our Women of Excellence group me. For instructions on how to join or for questions or concerns, please email our Women of Excellence team at w-o-e-n-m-t at gmail.com. We are so excited to continue our fellowship with you. This is a reminder that our 30 days of prayer with Bishop will continue this Monday at noon. Thank you so much for your faithfulness in giving. This is also a reminder that there are three ways to give. Number one, you may give online at www.newmtcop.org. Number two, you may give by mail at 7822 Connors Road, Winston, Georgia, 30187. And the third way you may give is in person, and we will practice social distancing at the church on Sundays from 11 o'clock a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m., or Mondays from 10 o'clock a.m. to 2 o'clock p.m. Congratulations to our on Mrs. Jane Rookard for being named Teacher of the Year at Chapel Hill Middle School. Congratulations, Jane. Happy anniversary to all couples celebrating anniversaries and a happy birthday to everyone celebrating birthdays this month including our very own Bishop A. Reginald Lippman, who will celebrate his big day at home on April 30th. New Mountaintop, we care about you and we're praying for you and your family. Continue to check in with us to let us know how you and your family are doing. If you have a prayer request, please email your prayer to prayerwithbishop at gmail. Dot com. Continue to be safe by practicing social distancing. We love you. God bless you.
Well, praise the Lord and God bless you. Welcome to this time in the Word of God. We do thank, praise, and honor our great God for another chance to come before you with the Word of God. As I come on your screen, on your tablet, on your large television, or wherever you may be watching me, just know that I'm there with you and God is here with us both. I want to share a powerful word with you, but first let me say a word of prayer. Pray with me. Lord God, thank you for another chance to bless your name and to bless your people. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart to be acceptable in your sight, for you are my strength and redeemer. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Let the people of God everywhere say amen. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to invite your attention today to the third chapter of the Old Testament book of Daniel, verse number 16 through verse number 18. And in Daniel 3 and 16, in the Living Bible Translation, we find these words. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not worried about what will happen to us. Look at verse 17 and 18. If we are thrown into the fiery furnace, our God is able to deliver us. And he will deliver us out of your hand, your majesty. But if he doesn't, please understand, sir, that even then we will never, under any circumstance, serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have erected. I want to talk to you for the next few moments from this simple subject, and I want you to say it out loud right there in your own home. My faith is on fire. Come on, say it again out loud. My faith is on fire. Bless be the name of our strong and living God. The grass withers, the flowers fade away, but the word of our God shall stand forever. My faith is on fire. Ladies and gentlemen, we're living in a time that some might call a fire. What does fire do? Well, first of all, fire consumes, fire destroys, fire takes over, fire takes away, fire takes the joy out of life. To lose anything to a fire is to lose everything to a fire. Fires are not forgiving. Fires are not kind. Fires are not considerate. But I want to tell you today that even though we may be going through what feels like a fire, it's hot, it's uncomfortable, it's difficult, it's restrictive, it's keeping us within a certain median, within a certain range, within a certain parameter. I want to tell you that there was another fire that is burning at the same time. And that fire is also consuming. It is consuming every worry. It is consuming every doubt. It is consuming every fear. And I want to tell you today that my testimony is this. My faith is on fire. My faith is hot. My faith is burning. My faith is trusting God like never before. And the fire of my faith is far more powerful and far more deadly than the fire that the enemy has brought on these times. My faith is on fire. And ladies and gentlemen, when we look at this familiar story to many, we discover the story of four young men who go into Babylon unprotected, unannounced, and undesired, yet even though they come in on the bottom, because of the favor of God that rests upon their life, they end up on the top. Because there's something about favor that won't let you stay on the bottom too long. Eventually, favor will shift you to the top of your circumstance. That's why you got to believe God. You got to trust God. You got to know that God makes no mistakes. God makes no errors. And you got to know that the God we serve is absolutely, positively sovereign. 
and he can do what he wants to do when he gets ready to do it. He can bless you in the middle of a mess. And then he can turn around and take the mess that he blessed you in the middle of and add some age to it and make a message out of the mess that you're going through. Ladies and gentlemen, these young men that we know by their Babylonian given name as Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have a story to tell. Their faith was on fire. They were brought in as teenagers into Babylon. And to their surprise and to the shock and chagrin of the natives of Babylon, the king over Babylon saw something in them that he didn't see in people he had known all their lives. I tell you, favor will cause you to rise to the top when you've been on the bottom. And by the way, if you feel like you're on the bottom now, get ready to get on God's elevator because God will take you from the bottom of the bottom to the top of the top. These young men are now given positions of authority in the kingdom of Babylon. That makes the natives restless because they got positions that were created for them that the natives never imagined would ever even be created. In fact, they are put in charge over the folks that have been there all of their lives. And you know how that happens. You know that when God blesses you, when God blesses, the devil starts messing. People start getting jealous. They start hating on you. They start trying to figure out what your secret is, who you know, what did you pay? How did you get where you are? And sometimes all you can tell them is if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, I don't know where I would be. They come into town as slaves, but they end up now being supervisors over people who have been there all of their life. And the Bible tells us that they had a faith that had been ingrained in them since their boyhood that they maintained while they were in Babylon. They didn't let Babylon take their basic fundamentals of knowing who the true and living God is. Come here, lean in. I want to bless you real quick. You may feel like you're in a strange place, in a strange land, at a strange time. You may even feel like a strange person with strange situations, with strange restrictions and strange stipulations on your life. But don't let Babylon take away your blessing. You see, your blessing will follow you whether you're in Babylon whether you are in Brooklyn or whether you are in Barbados, the blessing of the Lord that's on your life will work in any situation you can face in your life. And the text teaches us that they trust God in the most unusual ways and at the most unusual times. When you read this book of Daniel, you'll discover that chapter number three is where Nebuchadnezzar, who was king at the time, decides to erect a statue of himself. He was so into himself that he thought he'd make him a God that looked like him. This God was 99 feet tall and it was nine feet in diameter. It was solid, solid gold, a gold plated all the way around. And he commanded that all of those in the city of Babylon in that province were to come and bow down and worship as soon as they heard the music playing. Well, if he commanded the people, you know that the officers and those who he had given authority to were required to show up too. That's why you got to be careful about accepting every little thing that the enemy tries to offer you because you got to learn that tricks are for kids. Now in this scenario, however, God put them there by the hand of their enemy. It was God's will that they be in these positions for this very time. And as they are approaching this scene, they notice that everybody bows down and yet they are still standing up. Nebuchadnezzar gets a little upset with them and he reminds them of all that he has done for them and all he has given to them and the positions that they have. He gave it to them. That government crib they live in, he gave it to them. That government cheese they keep slicing, he gave it to them. That government job, he gave it to them. And he says to them, I'll give you one more chance. You can either bow or burn. If you don't bow down this time 
and worship my golden image, I'm going to cast you into a human sized oven, a burning fiery furnace. But what Nebuchadnezzar did not know was fire was right up their alley because fire would not cause them to fear. They were already on fire. They were on fire on the inside before he ever thought about starting a fire on the outside. And there's something about God and having a connection with him that no matter what's going on on the outside, there's a fire that burns on the inside that says, I will trust in the Lord until I die. That says, I will stay on the battlefield for my Lord. There's a fire on the inside that when we pray, there's a prayer wheel that keeps on turning and a fire that keeps on burning. So when he threatened to throw them in a fire, they already had fire in them. Consequently, they weren't worried about being thrown into what's already on the inside of them. Let me bless you real quick. Because when we look at that 16th verse, the first thing that Lord shows us in this message about my faith is on fire is number one, that we ought to have faith that is on fire because we make this declaration. We are not worried. I love it. I love it. I dare you to just say it out loud right there where you're watching me. We are not worried. Now, I know some of you didn't say it, because you are worried. But the reason why I want you to open your mouth and say it is because when your spirit hears your words that come out of your mouth, your spirit begins to take on the words that you declare and you then become what you say. And so when you make the declaration, I am not worried. What you're saying is I know in whom I have believed. Now look at verse 16. This is so powerful. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not worried about what will happen to us. And I wish I could get about 25, 40, 50 believers to join in with me and declare right now over your life, Daniel 3, 16, the A clause. O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Fill in the blank with whatever you want to put there. All sickness and disease, all poverty and struggle, all famine and pandemic. We are not worried about what will happen to us. You can have a faith that is on fire when you make the declaration, I am not worried. Listen, you got to get to the point in your life where you glance at the problems but gaze on the problem solver. Let me do that one more time. I said, you got to get to the point in your life where you glance at the problem, but gaze at the problem solver. In other words, you glance at your dilemma. You are aware that it's there. You are aware that there are certain risks. You are aware of the need for distancing. You are aware of the need for protecting yourself, but you only glance at that, but you gaze on the God who made you before you knew you would have to protect yourself from that. Because when you glance at that, you're saying, I know you're there, but I'm not worshiping you. When you gaze at him, you're saying, I know you're there and I am worshiping you. And is there anybody listening to me right now that may be going through a season of worry, of anxiety in your life? I want to tell you, Declare it out loud. Open your mouth so your spirit man hears you. You don't have to touch your neighbor ever again in your life while I'm preaching. I promise you that. But speak loud enough for your spirit to hear yourself say, we are not worried. And do you know why they said we are not worried? It is because they understood that worry literally means to choke your faith to death. You see, when you trace the etymology in the Greek, this is Hebrew, but when you trace it in the Greek, when you look at the word anxiety and worry in Philippians chapter number four, where Paul says, be careful for nothing or anxious for nothing, or in other words, worry about nothing. He is literally saying that when you worry, you literally choke your faith to death. You stop positive words from coming out of your mouth when you worry. You stop positive words from going into your mouth when you worry. You stop positive vibes from coming from your life when you worry. 
When you worry, you are taking matters into your own hand and trying to fix it yourself. Who is it that's choking yourself? You're trying to swallow stuff you can't even chew. You need to understand that when you make that declaration over your life, I not worry. I will not be anxious. We will not worry. You are sending a nervous breakdown to the pit of hell because all the enemy wants you to do is look at the threats that are going on in your life and look at the threat of losing your job and look at the threat of losing your car and look at the threat of losing your house. But you've got to speak into the atmosphere and you've got to declare a word to the enemy. We are not worried. And do you know why they didn't worry? It's because they knew who they served. And so he said, we are not worried what will happen to us. Why? They knew that they serve the God who has the whole world and all in it, in his hands. And he is the God who takes care of the sparrow. He is the God who feeds the animals. He is the God who takes care of the lilies in the field. He is the God that made the heavens and the earth and the celestial bodies and put the baby blue bosom of the sky up there and painted pretty puffy white clouds without a ladder or paintbrush. It was him that made us. It was him that created us. It was him that called us. It is him that keeps us. Therefore, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Psalm 27. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked and even my foe came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell though a host should encamp against me in this will I be confident. We are not worried. And it's time for the church to stand up and speak up and let the world know that we are not worried about what will happen to us because the God we serve is the God who created all of this. Somebody say it again out loud. We are not worried. And you've got to have a faith that is on fire that will look beyond the facts and focus on the faith and say, I see this and I hear this. I'm aware of this, but I will not worry. He will take care of me. He will feed me. He will clothe me. He'll keep a roof over my head. He'll keep some food on the table. He'll keep my health together. He'll keep my family well. We are not worried. Well, brothers and sisters, lest I hold you too long, before I get too happy too quick, let me move on to this second point that this passage teaches us in this message. Number two, not only must you declare we are not worried when you have a faith that is on fire, but you've got to number two declare we are not without. We are not without. Say it out loud so your neighbor can hear you across the street. Come on. We are not without. Look now at Daniel chapter three, verse number 17. And this blesses me because watch what Daniel continues to say. He says, if we are thrown into the flaming furnace, our God is able to deliver us. Oh, you better learn when to shout before we get back to the building. Again, if we are thrown into the flaming furnace, our God is able to deliver us. And watch this. Not only is he able, but he says, and he will deliver us out of your hand, your majesty. Now, Daniel says, in essence here, my faith is on fire. Not only are we not worried, but hey, let me let you know, we are not without. Not without what, Daniel? We're not without a provider. We are not without a protector. We are not without a great high priest. We are not without our father. And watch this. If we are thrown into it, He's going to save us from it or rescue us through it. One way or the other, no worries about it. He's going to step in. We are not without. He says if we're thrown into the flaming furnace, that's fine. Our God is able to deliver us. Watch this. Daniel says, we are not without a sovereign God. We are not without a God who cannot defeat 
this thing. We are not without a God who cannot defeat this. We are not without a God who cannot defeat this. Why did I say that three times? It's not because my record is stuck. You see, I had a teacher in school that once told me if I say things three times, look for it on the test. Let me say it one more, one more, one more for the road. We are not without a God who can defeat every enemy and every foe and every attack uh, every agenda of the devil against the people of God. I said, we are not without. Listen, you may feel like it. You may feel hopeless. You may feel helpless. You may feel like it's all going to pot. You may feel like it's all falling apart, but we are not without. Notice he says, our God is able to deliver us. I wonder, do I have anybody watching me right now that that is your testimony, that our God is able to deliver us? How did he know God was able to deliver? Evidently, he must have flipped back through his faith file of what God had already done. Can I show it to you real quick? Watch this. Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could say, our God is able to deliver by virtue of the fact of just looking back where God had brought them from. Watch this now. They came into this nation as immigrants and slaves. They came into this nation of Babylon as minorities who were mistreated. And yet at the time of the text, they're holding governmental official positions over folks who have been there all of their lives. Come here, lean in, hold up, wait a minute, let me put some preaching in it. You need to look back over your own history, over your own life. You need to think back, some of you, to the fact that your ancestors and my ancestors were not born in these ununited states of America, but they were brought over on slave ships and stolen as captives on slave ships stacked on top of each other. And here we are today, every major position, it has representation of every ethnicity, of every race, every hue, every color, which means every now and then, you gotta stop and think back where the Lord brought you from. I dare you to just look back right quick. Preacher, what you got me looking at? I want you to look back at over all the Lord has brought you from. I want you to look back over all the Lord has brought you through. I want you to think about when you cried by yourself, when you didn't know how you were gonna make it through school, when you didn't know how you were gonna pay your bills, when you didn't know where your next can of spam was coming from. I want you to think back uh, of when the dining hall was closed for the weekend and you were stuck on campus with no car and no money and nowhere to eat. But God somehow or another let you get somewhere to get something to eat. And that same God who kept our ancestors, that same God who brought you through elementary, middle, junior high, high school college that brought you through grad school, that brought you through divorce, that brought you through remarriage, that brought you through bankruptcy, that brought you through lawsuits, that brought you through losing this and losing that and getting back on your feet is the same God who will do it all again. Is there anybody listening to me that knows that if he did it before, he can do it again? Same God right now and same God back then. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could talk this kind of bold talk because their faith was on fire just based upon what God had already done in their history. And your future is no mystery when God is running your history. Did you hear what I said? I said your future is no mystery when God has already been working and running through your history. He says our God is a I just want you to say that out loud. Our God is able. I don't care what you're facing. Our God is able. I don't care if you're laid off. Our God is able. I don't care if your boo thing is acting bad. Our God is able. I don't care if your kids are getting on your nerves. Our God is able. I don't care if your hair is nappy. Our God is able to deliver us. And he will. Watch this now.
Watch this now. And he will. You've got to learn how to speak faith when it doesn't make sense. Ooh. You got to learn how to declare faith in your life when it doesn't make sense. You got to learn that faith is not limited to timing. Faith is not limited to things working out and lining up. Faith operates the moment you believe it, the moment you speak it, it goes into the atmosphere and begins to happen. And he will deliver us out of your hand. I want to make this clear to every attack, every agenda of the enemy, everything that the devil is trying to do to the people of God. Our God is able to deliver us and he will deliver us out of your hand. Now, you got to understand, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that we have got to get to the point where we can declare we are not worried. We got to get to the point where our faith gets on fire, where we can say we are not without but here's number three as i head to order close you got to get to the point in your life and we learned this from this text where you can declare we are non-stop worshipers oh oh you ought to praise him right there if you're a non-stop worshiper that's verse 17 can i show it to you let me show it to you here it is we are non-stop worshipers verse number 18 but if he doesn't do it oh my god Please understand, sir. Watch this. Now, 17, he says, our God is able to do it. But 18 says, but if he doesn't, now stop right there. Is he expressing doubt? Not at all. Is he thinking God is not going to come through? Not at all. What he is saying is that he has the sovereign authority to deliver us one way or another. Watch it. It's right there in the text. If he doesn't, Please understand, sir, that even then, my faith won't change. Watch this. Even then, we will never, under any circumstances, serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have erected. Now, here's what he's saying. We are non-stop worshipers. In other words, in verse 17, we're going to praise him if he brings us out. In verse 18, we're going to praise him if it takes us out. Either way it goes. I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul, Psalm 34, shall make her boast of the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. You've got to understand that it's time for you to be a nonstop worshiper. See, some folk, their verse would have read differently than verse 18. They would have said that if he doesn't do it and it gets a little too hot, we're going to ring a bell or something. And we're going to be waving at you to say, come get us out of here. But they say even if he doesn't do it this way, he's going to deliver us some way or another. And you've got to be a nonstop worshiper that says, I don't care what's happening in the world, what's happening in my life. I might be at home alone, but I'm never alone because wherever I praise him, he inhabits the praises of his people. And you got to be a nonstop worshiper. Can you send up some praise right now in your living room, in your kitchen, in your dining room, in your bedroom, laying there in the bed with that comforter close to around your head? Lift him up right now, because in the midst of it all, we are nonstop worshipers. And watch this. Nonstop worshipers get nonstop work. In other words, if you worship him nonstop, He'll show you he's working on your behalf nonstop. Can I show it to you? I'm going to do it anyway. Look at verse 21, Daniel 3, 21. So they bound them tight with ropes. Oh, God, watch this picture now. Got to see this picture. Watch this. Wake up. Watch this. So they bound them tight with ropes and threw them into the furnace, fully clothed. They wanted to make sure that they were going to burn up. Verse 22, and because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames leaped and killed the soldiers as they threw them in. Now, the King James Version tells us that they, he commanded the furnace to be heated up seven times hotter than it normally was. And the heat was so hot that the men that threw them in literally combusted it and caught on fire themselves. That's a hot fire, ain't it? Well, there's a hotter fire in this text, and that is the fire that their faith had 
to believe God either way it goes, knowing they were going to have victory. Now watch the text. Verse 23, so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell down bound into the roaring flames. It looks bad right now. It looks like nothing's going to happen good. That's the same way your life is looking right now. But what you need to understand is that's not the end of the story. And this is not the end of your story. You got to keep reading to see what God is going to do in your life. Here it is. Let's keep reading. Daniel 3, 24. But suddenly, I like that word already. As he was watching, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we throw three men into the furnace? <laughs> yes, they said, we did indeed, your majesty. But now watch the next man in this furnace. Because that next verse, that next verse is powerful, y'all. Because look what it says. Well, look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men and they are unbound. Ooh, we threw three in tied up. But now I see four and they're all untied and they are walking around in the fire and they aren't even hurt by the flames. And the fourth one looks like a God. Now, now watch this, y'all. They put them in one way, but when they put them in, they made one error because the text tells us that they wrapped them up in clothes and they tied them down. And they tied their hands and they tied their feet and they threw them in on their face. And they made two mistakes, not just one, but two here. Number one, whenever a child of God is on his knees or on his face, he's in a position of prayer. Come here. I want to bless you. And I want you to know that when you feel like your face is to the dirt, that's the right place to be. Because God recognizes that as a position of elevation because prayer will take you higher than anything else ever could. But the second mistake they made was that they tied up their arms and their hands and their feet, but they left their mouth wide open. And whenever a child of God is able to open his mouth and say, I will lift up mine eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth was able to call on Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Tiskanu, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Shiloh, Jehovah Shalom, something is bound to happen. They threw three men in tied up on their face. But now when they take another look at the church, uh oh, when they take another look at the believers, they see you're not alone. There's a fourth man in there. And this fourth man looks like God. I want to tell you that God's going to bring you out of this. God's going to bring you through this. And all the folks around you are going to say, it looks like God did it again. But that ain't all of the story. Watch this now. Verse number 24, as he was watching, I love it. Look at it again with me. Look at it again with me. As he was watching, as he was watching, Nebuchadnezzar was watching for them to burn because they wouldn't bow. But he didn't get what he was looking for. He thought they were going to burn because they didn't bow, but instead he watched them be blessed. Your enemy is looking for you to burn because you won't bow. But if they keep looking, they're going to watch you be blessed. Or oh, somebody ought to throw up your hand and give God a praise like it's Sunday morning at the cathedral. Because God is going to allow your enemies to see you be blessed. Oh, brothers and sisters, they said it looks like God has stepped in there with them. I want to tell you, family, that when you trust God like that, he'll show up wherever you are. When you believe God like that, when your faith catches on fire, he'll show up wherever you are. He stepped into the fiery furnace with them. And guess what? The next verse says that Nebuchadnezzar told Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out of the furnace. But wait a minute. Think with me just a minute. There were four men in the furnace. But he tells the ones he could see to come out of the furnace. Do you know what that means? Four, take away three, is one. You're a smart church. You got a smartphone, a smart TV. You got a smart pastor. You know what that means? Four, we're in there. Three, 
came out of there. That means that there's one man that's still in there. Do you know who he is? He is the fireman, Jesus, who comes along in every fiery furnace you face to take the heat out of your flame. And since he didn't come out of there, he's waiting on you. But the next time you get into a fiery furnace, he's already in there, snatching the heat out of the flame. That's what he did on Calvary's cross. He snatched the power of death, hell, and grave away from them and said, oh, death, where's your sting? Grave, where's your victory? I want to pray for you now and pray with you. You don't know Jesus. Pray with me, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart. I admit that I'm a sinner. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I repent of my sins. Forgive me. Wash me white as snow. I accept your grace. And by faith, I am born again. In Jesus' name. You just prayed that prayer for the first time. Welcome to the body of Christ. Send us an email and let us know that you just came to the Lord Jesus. I want to invite you you have a prayer request or you just prayed that prayer for the first time, send me an email, prayerwithbishop at gmail.com. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. We love you. And may God ever keep your faith on fire. Jesus keep me Oh, 
In the cross, in the cross, 